thank you to all our participants and all those who will be listening to this, uh, uh, this panel. The panel discussion today is on federalism as a peace-building tool in divided societies. This is the second year that the Forum of Federations has organized a panel of the Geneva Peace Week, and we're very grateful to the hosts of the Geneva Peace Week for giving us an opportunity to put this panel together. It's a pleasure for us to organize this year's event in partnership with the government of Ethiopia, who has been a steadfast supporter of the work of the Forum in Ethiopia. Let me begin at the outset by thanking our panelists who join us across three continents uh, to take time out from the very busy schedules to be here uh, for this event. I also would like to thank our partners at the, Swiss, at the Swiss Development Corporation and Global Affairs Canada, without whose ongoing support we could not have put this event together. Since the end of the Cold War, there has been an increased use of federalism as a tool of conflict resolution in deeply divided societies. The potential of federalism to facilitate the accommodation of differences, to protect minority groups, to prevent territorial disintegration, and to craft an architecture of stability in deeply divided societies has made it an attractive way of organizing politics in diverse and large societies. Since 1990, a number of countries such as Ethiopia, Sudan, Nepal, South Africa, and Bosnia have experimented with various forms of federalism, while others such as Cyprus, Myanmar, and the Philippines have considered the federal option as an important pathway to preserving national unity and resolving conflict. The panel brings together practitioners from three countries who consider how federalism has either helped to establish peace in their countries or is seen as being at the heart of the reconciliation process and preserving unity at the end of decades of conflict. We have here represented three countries, Ethiopia, that has had experience of building and ma managing a federal system for almost three decades now. We have Myanmar, which is having its own discussions around how to federalize the country in order to end decades of co conflict and insurgency. And we have Cyprus, which, where since the 70s, at least under the UN agreements, there is a, a, an articulated uh, position that the future of the country has to be built on the basis of bicommunal, uh, binational federalism, uh, bizonal federalism, but where there has, hasn't yet been substantive engagement on moving in the direction of federalism. And so we see three countries at three different um, uh, points in their evolution or, 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 their, or their journey towards federalism. Let me start by introducing our three accomplished participants. The first person I'd like to introduce is Her Excellency Almaz Mekonen, State Minister of Peace Building and National Consensus at the Ministry of Peace from the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Her Excellency has more than two decades of versatile experience at various levels of government, both federally as well as at the subnational level. She has worked in parliament and within the executive. She has been, since 2008, a member of the Addis Ababa City Council. And she has also worked as a member of the Legal and Administrative Standing Committee of Parliament, uh, as well as Public and International Relations Department head at the Parliament of Ethiopia. Uh, she's a lawyer by training, uh, having trained in international relations and international law from the University of Amsterdam. The second person I'd like to introduce is Devia Beatli, a peace activist born and raised in Cyprus. She has lived and worked in the United Kingdom, Belgium, Turkey, and France. That helped her go beyond the traditional narratives one looks at Cyprus from the society and looks at society from a very different perspective. She is uh, an accomplished print and broadcast journalist and also has been a very, very active member of civil society, pushing for the establishment uh, of a e EU member, Federal Cyprus. She's a founding board member of the Cyprus EU Association and the Third Community uh, Forum. The last person uh, I will introduce this morning, and I, I leave him for last because he is also a colleague, uh, is uh, Tet Milwin, who is the head of the Forum of Federation's country office in Myanmar. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, Tet has been a long-time civil society activist uh, within, within Myanmar. 
he was uh, at one time the public relations officer for the All Burma Federation of Students Union in Mandalay. He worked as a research associate at Myanmar Egress, looking at politics and socioeconomic research programs. Uh, he has been a junior member of the Peace Negotiation Dialogues. Uh, he attended the Oslo Forum on Democratization, Peace, Global Governance, and Mid-Level Professionals. Uh, even though he is originally by training a doctor, a medical doctor, uh, he also holds a master's degree in political science from the Central European University. So thank you, uh, panelists, for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, I, I hope it'll be uh, a riveting and engaging discussion that we have uh, this, uh, on, on this panel. This panel will explore how federalism and federal state architecture has been used to support peace building and conflict resolution efforts, uh, looking at successes and failures and challenges. The panel will aim to contribute to building knowledge on the dynamics between federalism and peace building. The panel will also consider the challenging process by which uh, federalism has been established in, in some countries and the challenges that lie ahead for those who are on their journey towards federalism or not. Uh, you know, we, we will find that out only in the fullness of time. So what, what we're going to do is, uh, I, I have three core questions that I will pose to each of the panelists and then uh, have them talk about their own experiences, the experiences from their own country in, in how these, uh, these issues are being addressed or have been addressed. And then as the, as the discussion moves forward, we can, you know, we, we can go down different, uh, different pathways to tease out uh, different issues. So let me start with uh, Minister McConnell. How, uh, how has federalism been used as a peace building tool in your country? In other words, what is it that brought Ethiopia uh, to the path of federalism after many years of um, centralized rule and, and before that, uh, you know, rule in the form of, a, of an absolutist monarchy? The Minister McConnell. So thank you, Ropak, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, and I would like to take this um, opportunity to thank the organizers in uh, actually uh, Forum of Federation uh, to, for organizing this important panel and discuss on this important issue, uh, which is federalism. And I would like to start my uh, addressing the question by federal system as a remedy to ethno-national conflict in Ethiopia. So as you may know uh, very well, uh, prior to the federal arrangement, uh, we had a f different re regimes like uh, the monarchy and the dictator regime, uh, the dark regime. So a central extended uh, suppression and oppression of identities, deprivation of human and de democratic um, rights, monarchical and military dictator, uh, dictatorial rule, unitary philosophy and operational arrangement is that self-rule, lack of development with extreme poverty and uh, backwardness were the real manifestation of, of the past Ethiopia, uh, which in turn led to protests and civil wars that devastated again human and capital resources of the country. Uh, so sporadic protests uh, occurred in several parts of the country that during that time and later replaced with a protracted civil war, which fully uh, toppled the, the then military regime. So um, then immediately after the downfall of the military regime, the Derg regime, in 1991, a transitional government was established with responsibility, including ensuring peace and security and stability, in the first of all, and organizing a constitutional commission to draft the constitution, uh, establishing a constitutional assembly uh, in order to ratify the draft constitution and also organizing uh, national election as per the constitution. Moreover, in this process, about 27 political parties, among them were 17 were um, armed political movements and civil societies were represented in the transitional government. Uh, that, that was uh, for the first time in Ethiopia's history different political groups with varying interests and objectives dialogue together and decide on the future of the country. Uh, accordingly, uh, the internal political situation was characterized by ethnic identity, uh, cleavages that led to extreme political divisions, 
Broadly speaking, uh, the political positions held by the then political parties could be categorized into three. The first one, there were centripetal forces that had the objective to bring back the overthrown regime and unitary system. Uh, secondly, there were also centrifugal forces that are in sharp antagonism with the former put cessation as only option to overcome the risk of being under national oppression. And third, in third one forces, there were also forces that believe on democratic multinational and multicultural union based on the will and consent of the nations and nationalists of, and peoples of Ethiopia. And finally, a position that aimed at maintaining unity in diversity. Unity in diversity, which was anticable, anticable, anticable before, was uh, finally realized. Hence, the country was the verge of, at the verge of the inter integration, I mean disintegration, because the time was also in the Cold War, as you have already mentioned, and Ethiopia has a background with the socialist camp, because the regime has uh, really uh, affiliated very well with the politics, it was a socialist uh, system. The way out from this deep political division were really to, to form a transitional government that include all the political forces and representatives of several communities of the Ethiopian people. And then to draft a constitution that to be ratified on political negotiations of the political forces and to establish the electoral board and carry out elections according to the constitution. And finally, the actual process had to pass through this roadmap and was indeed realized with great commitment to accommodate the various interests and political positions that constitution was ratified finally. The nation, a national and regional election was carried out for the first time in the history of Ethiopia, perhaps per the constitution. And forces of democratic multinational and multicultural union uh, that stood for unity with diversity won in the first historic election of that in the country uh, at federal as well as at the state council's level. So uh, this is what uh, I can address uh, uh, for the first question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. So Daria, let me turn to you on Cyprus. Uh, the issue of federalism has been discussed as part of the Cyprus settlement since the 1970s. Yet of all of these cases uh, that we have represented here today, there's probably been the least movement in Cyprus. And I think it'd be interesting to understand why federalism was seen as a solution or is still seen as a solution or is it and 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 what the challenges uh, have been in terms of moving forward in cyprus well very good questions actually and a very good time i should say well first of all thank you very much for um for this discussion i feel honored to be here and i also feel um, very jealous of a peace minister how I wish we could um, get to that point of having a, a federation and a peace minister um, in Cyprus. Unfortunately, our reality is completely different. We have been discussing federation since um, 1977, to be exact. It was the UN Security Council um, decision, actually, that was agreed by the leaders of the that time, the Turkish Cypriot and um, Greek Cypriot um, leaders. And um, we have been discussing on and off, I should say, um, a bi-zonal, bi-communal um, federation since then. There have been um, leaders from from the left, from the right, from the middle, discussing the same issue over and over. And um, nowadays, actually, the Turkish Cypriot community is heading towards uh, electing um, our leader for the next um, five years um, on the 11th of October. And um, we are in the process of the election campaigns right now. And um, there is the current leader who is insisting on a federal settlement. There is another candidate that is um, sort of talking about federation, but quite um, with an intimidation, let's say. 
and the rest is talking about a two-state federation, two-state um, solution, um, which is practically partition. And um, when this is happening, there is also our so-called motherlands, the Turkey and Greece, and um, now France and Germany getting involved as well, trying to um, calm down the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean, where um, we're fighting, or rather they're fighting and we're watching um, over the gas in the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, we do see Turkey, um, threatening, I would say, um, of uh, attacking, or um, let me put it in a, in a uh, better way, as um, claiming the Turkish Cypriot rights over gas um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, with Turkish Cypriots watching. And um, we are also trying to say that the elections on the um, 11th of October need to be the decision of the Turkish Cypriots to decide on the leader who is going to start the negotiations um, right after the elections, which was a few days back um, um, confirmed by uh, Mr. Guterres, the UN Secretary General, and Turkish leadership um, keeps telling us that um, it may not be exactly our decision. So we are um, actually in the middle of all these discussions in, um, in Cyprus. People coming and um, going to the island uh, um, from the United States, from Russia, from the EU, trying to um, calm down the situation and also further their own interests over the island. And um, I'm here... The, 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 is it, I mean, I, I, the, the Cypriot case in that sense is very, I think, very unlike Ethiopia, and we'll hear about Myanmar in a moment, in that you, are, you, you have a situation of a deeply divided society with outside powers that have, have a veto on how the process moves forward. That's right. They, I mean, this has always been the case. Cyprus has been um, in the appetite of uh, many different civilizations over centuries, and uh, many different powers have been trying to um, play games over Cyprus. But I have to say that, unfortunately, we as Cypriots did not play our part of being together, getting together, working together either. So um, I think we should um, share the responsibility of still being a deeply divided society. I'll come back to that question in a minute. I'm going to move to Tet. Thank you very much uh, Thank you. for your, your intervention. Tet, again, to return to the issue of Myanmar, uh, as you and I know, before 2012, 2011, federalism was the F word in Myanmar and nobody would talk about it. And yet this is now uh, at the heart of, uh, of ongoing political negotiations in the country. So if you would please address uh, you know, how uh, you or, or people in Myanmar or parties in Myanmar or stakeholders in Myanmar have come to see federalism as such an important um, tool in, in building reconciliation uh, within the country. Thank you very much, uh, Rupak, and I'm honored to be a part of this panel. As you said, um, federalism has become an from a taboo word to the talk of the town uh, for recent years. Um, before I uh, delve into that issue, I would like to start with a little bit of historical context, uh, because I think it, it, it is very important to go back to history and look at uh, the situation uh, at the modern state formation in Myanmar. As you know, um, Myanmar essentially was an agrarian society pretty much before the British colonized the country completely in 1885 and then annexed as like uh, a part of uh, British India. Um, uh, before the British rule, if you look at what Myanmar is now today, you will see uh, the central plains of the Irrawaddy Valley and the hill regions in the north, in the, in the east and in the west. And... Uh, and, and when British uh, took over the country, they devised a very interesting thing. Um, 
a two system, uh, two system of governance. So they devise a system for the central plains of the Irrawaddy Valley and another system, which they call the frontier area system, frontier area administration for the hill regions. Uh, so one in 1947, we, after the second world war, we started the, uh, the negotiations with the British for the independence. Um, it was a dire need for the central plains of the, the Irrawaddy Valley, the people of the valley, and also the people of the hill regions together to form an agreement to get independence from, from the British Empire. Uh, so from the very beginning of the modern state formation in Myanmar, we can see this, this is uh, the need of a territorial division of powers, or at least a territorial agreement of you know, uh, how uh, people will govern the country. And of course, as well, partly on the basis of ethnicity since the very beginning of the founding uh, days. Uh, but uh, after 10 or so years of independence, the ethnic minorities were not very happy with the arrangement. So they call for constitutional negotiations of how they would devise a constitutional federalism in independent Burma. And the military took this as an excuse, a justification, a raison d'etre uh, to stage the coup. And since 1962, we was, uh, under the military dictatorship for like uh, for the for next uh, 60 years or so and with the military dictatorship the authoritarian rule and the military propaganda as such that federalism would uh, disintegrate the union and uh, it would have a huge impact on the territorial integrity of the nation with that like uh, uh, the 65 percent of the majority Burma people they started to see federalism as a, as, a, as a danger, as a threat to the integration of the union. Whereas the, for the ethnic minorities, this has been the, uh, the, the dearest political aspiration for more than six decades. And with the like, democratic transition starting in 2011, um, the, the government started to revisit this and then try to negotiate and the civil strife uh, on the basis of federalism. And since then, federalism has become, you know, the, the talk of the town, the flavor of the town. But yet uh, the dilemma or the question is, which kind of federalism we would like to adopt in Myanmar? So this is how it evolved over time. And as you can see, because of the military dictatorship and also the pre-colonial uh, pre and post-colonial nature of the society. We're pretty much a divided society. 65% of the majority Burma people on the side, on, on one side, and 35% of more than, you know, 130 ethnic groups on the other side. So I, I thank you very much. Uh, I think um, this will pave the way for the, the questions upcoming. I, I, uh, just to clarify, or uh, uh, for, for, for those who are listening in, uh, the, 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 the federal idea didn't, didn't just magically appear in 2011 or 2012. This was something that was originally discussed also in Pangong after independence, right? And so this, yeah. is, this is essentially the wheel coming a full circle uh, exactly. in, in terms of talking about future settlements for the country. Absolutely, yeah. The, the, the idea of federalism rooted in the uh, 1947 Panglong Agreement of uh, you know this agreement uh, essentially brought in independence for the country, and since then we haven't solved this issue of uh, uh, how we would govern this like very diverse, ethnically, religiously diverse state. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, this uh, the, the the various presentations have raised an important issue that's often contested in in the federal context. Uh, there are those who see federalism as um, panacea for all kinds of things. Um, and the, the, there are others who see federalism as the first step to secession. And this is something I, can, I think we can talk about later. Uh, to return to Minister McConnell, uh, I, I, uh, if you, of, of all the three cases presented, Ethiopia has now been a federation for almost three decades. And what I would like to do is to ask you a little bit uh, to reflect on Ethiopia's experience as a federation uh, particularly in terms of what you think has worked, what hasn't worked, 
and what do you think uh, is is the path forward in in terms of the of the evolution of Ethiopian federalism? Thank you again, Mr. Ropak. Uh, I would like to address this question, uh, dividing into two major aspects. And the first one I would like to address about the achievements of uh, the Federation. And on the other hand, I would like to mention also, uh, talk about the challenges that we are facing uh, with having the federal, uh, during, uh, with uh, the implementation of Federation uh, aspect. So uh, just to address about uh, the success in the achievement of uh, the Federation, uh, since the formation of uh, the Federation, peace and security has been maintained for the last 27 years. Uh, which creates a favorable condition uh, for development, uh, though it's not perfect actually. Uh, it's also the danger of disintegration was completely curved. Uh, during that time, many countries have been disintegrated and um, very simple example, the Russian Federation has been completely disintegrated. And uh, as I have already mentioned it uh, previously, it was uh, completely affiliated with a socialist camp. So that was, everybody was expecting this country will be disintegrated, but lucky enough, the federal system has uh, completely covered the problem. So we remain and we, we, we take it like a rescue. Uh, it is an achievement that the legacy of unitarism that denies diversity has been replaced with uh, an agenda that respects cultural groups and gave place to self-rule actually, and symbols of democratic union, like uh, Constitution Day, the National Flag Day, National Emblem Day, and big uh, mega projects like GERD, the Renaissance Dam, I mean, and other mega projects have been common agenda of the general public. Uh, democratic republicanism, like the exercise of election and the creation of multi-party system are being realized. Uh, role of nations and nationalists in socio-economic growth through extensive uh, participation has fostered democratic process to the level that people are continuously demanding to improve their well-being. Uh, moreover, broad-based development with a rate of growth at level of double digit that continued for at least 40 consecutive years, fastest but not oil-based have been also realized in this country, as you may know it very well. Federalism and state-led development paradigm success was there. The dramatic increase in capacity to finance mega projects, as I have already mentioned, many, many dams have been established, like uh, dams like GERD, which is a very big one, first in Africa maybe, and train, train networks, which have been unthinkable before, rural and urban electrification and electrification, not only electrification, but telecommunication also, even in the rural areas, road networks, uh, sugar projectors, fertilizers, uh, IC technology, industrial purpose have been established in, in, in a marvelous way. In addition, in the way of this, there was also a building in market network, uh, expansion of elementary schools, secondary schools, Tibet, uh, more than 40 universe, 44 university, uh, public universities, in addition to many private ones, are also established. Expansion of health services that reach the lost administrative territories, and land ownership becomes as a property of the peasants, the, 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 the peasants, not the landlords, actually. That was on, not only an economic question, it was a political question for many years in the history of Ethiopia, and this has been answered by the constitution. And it, it was able to mitigate effect of respective drought that had been coming every 10 years in the history of Ethiopia. That's also possible to maintain. So this was the achievement that we have uh, practiced and expressed for the last uh, 30 years, I mean three decades, almost in seven years. And on the other hand, there was also challenges, not only the success, but also we are still facing the challenges of this federation. The, the first one is failure to maintaining balance between the self-rule and the shared rule, which in turn led to disputes and violation of some principles, actually. And extended practice of maladministration or rent-seeking corruption is also there. These are another challenge that we are facing this time. Weak institutional capacity that could address emerging challenges. There are emerging challenges that, that, as the very nature of federation is dynamic, so many, many questions are coming, demanding questions, 
interests are coming from the public and no one is going to answer these questions also. So weak intergovernmental relation dominated, the dominant party controlled. So the, be, between regions, the interaction is very weak. So uh, still we need to have, we need to work a lot so that this will not be another issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. These are the, the, the answers that I have for the second question. Thank you, Minister. I, I think the, the two issues you've, you've uh, highlighted, uh, I think, are very important. Uh, the first one, of course, is the, the entire issue around the balance between um, self-rule and shared rule. Uh, that's a very, very key question at the heart of all federations. And the second is the dynamic nature of politics and having to adapt to changing social, economic, uh, and political situations in a country. And again, these are some of the lessons you know, we, we can draw on for the other end. Uh, Deria, in the case of, uh, of Cyprus, uh, you know, given, given the challenges that you have to deal with in terms of outside intervention, what, what in your views would be some of the design issues you think that might both satisfy uh, the, the, the external players in Cyprus? as well as meet the aspirations of Cypriots in terms of building a federal, a unified federal Cyprus. Hello again. Um, I think we have to look at the um, Cypriots' approach to, the, um, to, to a federal Cyprus, or let's say to um, building this uh, federal Cyprus that we have been discussing over years. And um, the latest uh, signed agreement, I will say, although um, it wasn't actually signed, but it was um, sort of pushed to be signed by the two leaders in 2002. That was the Anon plan proposed by, um, proposed in 2002 by, um, by the um, Secretary General Kofi Annan back then. And um, after a few versions of uh, negotiations, uh, after um, long negotiations, a few versions of the Anand plan came on the table. And finally, we voted for the fifth Anand plan um, a few days before Cyprus's um, accession to the European Union. It was, I think, about a week ago. But the accession treaty was already um, signed in Athens the year before. So um, back then, the Greek Cypriots would become a, a member of the European Union unilaterally because uh, Protocol 10 that was annexed to the accession treaty was saying that the acquis communautaire, um, the um, EU rules and regulations would be suspended in the Turkish Cypriot community. So if we look at the atmosphere back then, Turkish Cypriots actually wanted to, um, to go for a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation with political equality. That was um, the Anon plan, basically, um, because there were economic difficulties, and there was this prospect of the membership, the EU membership, that was uh, the carrot for Turkish Cypriots. On the other hand, the Greek Cypriots already signed the agreement, um, the accession agreement to the European Union, which meant security for them. As a small island, they were um, afraid um, from Turkey and the European Union membership would bring them um, security. So there were actually different um, expectations and aspirations from the Anon plan back then. The issues um, in the Anon plan and um, on the discussions are um, very, very, um, very much discussed and mostly agreed upon. But what is missing, what was missing back then, and what is still missing on either one side or the other, is the political will. And um, maybe I shouldn't say either on the one side or the other, because there are other actors um, involved as well. And um, I'm talking about, um, obviously, the guarantors of the current Republic of Cyprus, which was um, formed in 1960 after British um, after the end of the British um, uh, rule in Cyprus. And um, 
it seems that bringing everybody on the same table to agree on different issues is possible. It is still possible. Um, and um, I was reading a late um, study a few days back on different um, different formulas of um, these four dossiers that have been um, discussed. It was in Nanan plan. It is now in the Guterres framework, which is the latest um, basis of discussions. One is the territory because currently Cyprus is um, divided into two. In the north, there is the Turkish Cypriots um, living, and the south, there are the Greek Cypriots. So one issue is territory. The other issue is the property, because after the division, um, there is a lot of Greek Cypriot property that is left in the north, and um, Turkish Cypriot property that is um, left in the south and um, the discussion over what is going to happen to, to this um, is uh, a, a difficult part of the, of the negotiations. The other one is guarantee. We currently have um, five armies on the island claiming to protect us from external um, danger. So how are we going to deal with this is um, another one. And of course, the the most important is um, the federation itself, power sharing. How are we going to build this? Um, the remarks of the Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, um, back um, in Crown Montana, that was the failure of the latest talks in 2017, was that we are very close to a, to a settlement. There is uh, a lot of improvement um, a lot of um, agreement on, on many issues and um, what is missing is the political one. So um, let's hope that this political will, will be um, existing on all sides at the same time so we'll see the federation in Cyprus soon. Maria, is it um, fair to say that federalism still remains at the heart of the settlement? Of the, of the potential settlement in Cyprus? It is the only way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kent, uh, same question for you. Uh, do all stakeholders in Myanmar see federalism as the way forward in Myanmar, even, even when they disagree uh, on, on, the way, on, on what kind of federalism? Or, or is it that some pay lip service but really are not, uh, are not federally inclined? Um, absolutely. Uh, Almost all major stakeholders in Myanmar politics, they agree um, federalism, you know, one way or another, one form or another. It is not about like um, federalism or something else, but it is federalism. But again, the question is like, which kind of federalism? What model? So I was very impressed uh, hearing the Ethiopian minister talking about the federal and subnational division of power and implementation in uh, Ethiopia, that, 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 uh, uh, that is like uh, inspiring. Um, in Myanmar, if you look at the, uh, the constitution, uh, the 2008 constitution, which was sponsored by the military, uh, you can see the character of uh, federi uh, federalism, federation in Myanmar is a very much a dis uh, a highly centralized uh, federation. We have uh, a constitutional division of uh, powers, but still very little for subnational level. And then the fiscal arrangements are still very centralized. We do have uh, uh, two houses of legislature and also subnational legislatures. We have a constitutional tribunal and, and the list goes on. So uh, nominally, you can see all the constituent uh, requirements, constituent parts of the federal system in place in Myanmar constitutionally. But um, uh, as uh, we have seen in the case of uh, Ethiopia, the political process is very much also an, a major uh, variable, a major factor for the implementation of a, a federal state in the country. Because like, uh, not surprising, the military still, still holds a very important role in country's politics. 25% of the seats are reserved for them. 
in uh, national level legislature as well as in the sub-national legislatures and three most important cabinet portfolios namely the home home affairs home ministry the the defense ministry and the border affairs ministry are uh, held by uh, appointees uh, 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 they come from the military commander in chief uh, appointments um, and uh, also the constitution in Myanmar I think it is it 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 really suffices to say it is the most difficult con constitution in the world currently to change to amend because uh, you need more than um, you need more than all elected seats or elected MPs you always need a military uh, uh, military vote, the military approval to change the constitution. But um, nevertheless, I think it is uh, also important to look at the political process because as the Ethiopian minister uh, rightly pointed out, uh, it's a very similar situation in Myanmar because like when we started our political transition in 2010, after, you know, very controversial 2010 election, the military-backed USDP party got into power. They, they, are, they were in power both at the national and sub-national levels. So you can see there is not really space for sub-national governments to fight for, for their roles, for their decentralized roles, because they are from the same you know, dominant uh, political party. So the party hierarchy, uh, was the most important thing for them. And that, that pattern repeated itself in 2015 with the landslide uh, victory of uh, the National League for Democracy led by uh, Nobel Peace Laureate Dong San Suu Kyi. The same thing happened. She, uh, her, she and her party won for more than 80% of the uh, elected seats in, in the parliament. Uh, and yet, because uh, at the national, both at the national level and sub-national level, people people in power are from the same party. They really don't fight much for uh, uh, more uh, decentralized roles. So uh, after after the democratic transition, we started the peace negotiations, and the pattern is like successive central government. They are up for federalism, but what they want is actually an incremental implementation of decentralization. Whereas for the ethnic minorities and the ethnic um, armed organizations, uh, as you know, we have the longest civil war uh, in, the history of, uh, in the history of the world. Uh, for the ethnic minorities, both the you know, armed groups and ethnic political parties, they want a drastic and quicker uh, what they call genuine federalism. Basically, what they are talking about is a, a more decentralized uh, version of federalism. Uh, so with the, with the elections uh, looming uh, in uh, two months, uh, we will have the elections in, in November, we will see how the dynamics uh, uh, in, in the central government and also sub-national levels will change. And uh, that will also hugely have an impact on uh, the nature of federalism in this country, in, in Myanmar, I mean. Thank you, Ted. I think we are coming to the, towards the end of our uh, allocated time, but we have, we have some time for one more, uh, one more question. Uh, uh, Mr. McConnell, I'm going to ask you, as somebody who has been a practitioner of, of federalism for almost three decades, building federalism or, or building a new federal system uh, in Ethiopia from the very beginning, uh, what advice or what lessons uh, would, you, would you offer others who are setting on their journey towards federalism, whether it is Africa or anywhere else in the world? I mean, around Ethiopia, you have a number of countries who, have, uh, who are wrestling with the question of building a more federal state, uh, you know, South Sudan, of course, uh, but also Sudan, uh, uh, Somalia, uh, the uh, Kenya had its own debates around federalism, didn't become a federal country. But, you know, based on your own experiences, Ethiopia's experience, any, uh, uh, any lessons, advice that you, you would offer? Yeah, thank you again, uh, Ropak. Yes, we, after um, exercising and expressing uh, this new state formation, 
uh, and the, the system, federal democratic, uh, I mean, democratic federalism. Uh, as I have already mentioned it, the challenges that we have faced is there. So with all these uh, problems and um, good practices and the achievements, we got a lesson. Uh, anybody who could take uh, all these lessons because the common feature is the same for, for the federation, any federation. Any federation has its own feature and these are common in all aspects, be it ethnic, be it geography or any kind of format uh, in federation. So the lessons that we have learned through the process is, I think it's important uh, avoid defamation and polarization among all concerned. Uh, and basic challenges have emerged from within the system and hence with, with own capacity and solutions can only be emerged from within the system itself. In that case, there is no need of any foreign intervention. So it's better to avoid, I think with the Cyprus case, this is a lesson that you should have to get also uh, taken into consideration. Avoiding external intervention in our internal affairs is very important. This is a lesson that we have got uh, in case of Ethiopia. And more, moreover, inclusive national dialogue at all levels is uh, the only way out. This is the national dialogue, which is inclusive one, is very important at all levels, at the grassroots level, national, at national dialogue, so with the party, political parties level, a scholars level, any kind of uh, community, as a community level, like youth, women, at all levels, inclusive dialogue is very important. In that case, I think it's important to mention uh, that Forum of Federation is taking the initiative to make national dialogues in Ethiopia this time. So I, I, would like, uh, I would like to take this opportunity even to thank the Forum of Federation for getting and taking the, this initiative to organize such kind of national dialogues among political parties and civil societies and famous and uh, influential peoples so that um, the problems, the challenges that we are facing this time could be solved with the will and initiative of the general public too. So I think I have to appreciate and uh, um, express my, my thank you to the Forum of uh, Federation. Moreover, uh, all political forces and interest groups must sit together and this to address the current challenges. This is what we are doing with the Forum of Federation. Now we, are, um, we have started today even, there is a dialogue between political parties uh, in the history of the country because people are not uh, agreed on the, the past history of Ethiopia. You know, history could be up to the writer, you know? So someone will agree and some not. So they are still discussing uh, those concerned um, political in, uh, parties and uh, other entities. So I think uh, Forum of Federation is doing its best to make uh, uh, the national dialogues in Ethiopia practical. So thank you very much. Moreover, to take, we have also get uh, a lesson that to take the constitution as a baseline. Uh, strive for better, but not less than what the constitution provides for. It's better to domesticize, domestic, uh, I mean, to make it practical in, in your own way. So that the constitution will answer the dynamic questions, the dynamic nature of demanding society's question. So I think it's better to take constitution as it is uh, nature. And for all these questions to answer also, to, 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 to um, I mean, to, to, to solve all the challenges, it's important to have vibrant and dynamic leadership so that all the dynamic questions, all the demanding issues will be uh, answered proactively, not following the questions, but proactively to answer all the questions. The demand of the society is very important. This is the major lessons that we have learned from um, the process of the federation. So I think it's important to take also us uh, to, to, to make it practical, to get the lesson and make it implemented in a way of uh, the way forward. Thank you very much again. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Daria, yes. uh, in, the, in, in the case of Cyprus, uh, of course, it's slightly different because you, Cyprus has not quite begun its journey towards federalism. But as somebody who is uh, who's act, who's a peace activist and active in civil society, 
what are your how how do you see civil society playing a role a role in in moving uh, the needle on a on a peace settlement um Firstly, I want to say that I have um, noted down the, the four um, advice of uh, uh, Madam Minister, thank you very much. And I have to say that there isn't uh, much difference than my own notes of what to do as peace activists, as uh, the civil um, society um, in Cyprus to, to get there. Well. Let me um, say that I was talking about a recent study which was uh, done by, uh, by two universities, one in the UK and the other one in Cyprus on both communities. And they came up with a percentage, a very hopeful percentage of um, people supporting um, a bicommunal, bizonal um, federation as it is uh, proposed right now. And it's 76% of the Greek Cypriots and 71% of the Turkish Cypriots. And this is um, very promising. When we look at the figures of the Anon plan, it was um, 75 against federation and the Greek Cypriot community. And now we move to 76 um, supporting or finding it tolerable. Um, and the Greek Cypriot community. And the Turkish Cypriot community is um, almost the same. There isn't much um, difference with regards to the public opinion. Um, what is missing is, as I said, the political will is missing, trust is missing between the two communities. And this is where the civil society comes into the picture. We need to listen to each other. We need to understand. We need to start talking each other's language, literally, and um, in actually uh, talking the, the languages, understanding um, what the other communities' hopes and fears are, because they're completely different. My fear is much different than uh, Greek Cypriot um, peace activists. Uh, well, actually for the peace activists, more or less we have the same fear, which is partition, but uh, let's say a, a Greek Cypriot um, that uh, uh, has um, other fears. So firstly, we need to get together as peace activists because we haven't been doing this either. We're trying to fight against the forces, against the, re the reunification of our country on our um, separate sides us trying to um, fight against um, the nationalism, uh, the Turkish nationalism basically, and the, my compatriots on the other side working for federation fights the Hellenic nationalism, which is trying to block it. We need to get together and fight together. This is what has been missing um, since the beginning, and unfortunately it is still missing. And this is where my organization comes um, into the picture trying to build the third community. So we, we don't want to talk about the two communities anymore, but we, we are talking about creating a third community who believes in living together. So I think that's, um, that is very important and this is what keeps us going really, this hope. Thank you, Daria. Ket, the final, final uh, question or comment from you. Uh, you, you. You mentioned that uh, Myanmar is heading for an election and you know, we, we'll find out after the elections uh, what direction the peace talks uh, will take. Uh, in, in your view, what are some of the biggest hurdles, regardless of the outcome of the election, that needs to be surmounted as Myanmar moves towards some form of democratic federalism? Thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, what I will say about Myanmar will very much resonate with the, uh, uh, the two cases, uh, Cyprus and uh, Ethiopia as well. Um, the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges for federalism on the way forward uh, in Myanmar is uh, pretty much between the, let's say the two, uh, not the two groups, but the 65%, around 65% of the population who are Bama ethnic people, Bama majority, and 35% of the rest, the small minorities. 
Uh, and after more than 60 years of military dictatorship, along with press censorship, and you know, this like uh, taboo of federalism, because the propaganda was always that federalism would ultimately disintegrate the country, disintegrate the union. So the, the, the more than half of the population still believe in this, like uh, uh, the haunting aspect, the, 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 the myth or the propaganda that federalism is a bad thing. So, and as you can see, as Myanmar is uh, going towards a, a democratic country, the democratic pressure, if there is no democratic pressure from the population to federalize the country, uh, the elected government is more or less very much indifferent to, to this issue because like, you know, they, don't, uh, they don't see an incentive uh, for uh, federalism uh, in the country. Of course, if they don't see ending the you know, decade-long civil war as an incentive good enough. So um, the thing with Myanmar is, uh, that is what basically we are uh, working on. We have been supporting uh, uh, through the process. We are through the process. Uh, we are trying to, you know, tell people federalism not necessarily is for secession, but rather it is a tool uh, to 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 solve the conflict in this country. And the elites basically have agreed upon that uh, that thing. But still, the population, uh, the the grassroots, the, uh, uh, the, this uh, this is still a challenge, and uh, a, a related challenge is the visionary leadership, as uh, Minister uh, uh, McConnell uh, rightly said. Uh, because if you see the uh, electoral results in 2015, the NOD won more than 80 percent of the seats. So with this kind of democratic legitimacy, I think even if the population, the, the vast majority of the people aren't, are indifferent or are kind of like uh, nonchalant about the need, the, the dire need for federalism, the visionary leadership can take it forward and start, you know, uh, federal reforms. Basically, we are already in a federal setup, but uh, we need more uh, constitutional divisional powers, more fiscal, you know, uh, assignments, taxation assignments, and expenditure assignments, and also uh, uh, intergovernmental relations. We need to structure proper intergovernmental relations between the subnational and the national level government. So I think these are the uh, these uh, these are the uh, challenges. And of course, like um, from the side of the ethnic minorities, it is also very important for them to communicate what they want to the vast majority, the 65% of the population, the Pama people, so that like, you know, we are on the same page, all the ethnic groups are on the same page for a system of federalism that will end the civil conflict in this country, uh, in, in Myanmar. Now, I think that these are the challenges uh, from, 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 from my side to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. So before we wind up, I just want to draw out some of the issues that we've discussed. I think uh, the, the, the first thing I think that merits uh, uh, repeating again, uh, that federalism is merely a tool, right? It's, it's neither good nor bad. It's like a hammer. I mean, if you hit somebody on the head with a hammer, it's bad. If you use it to hit a nail in, that's what its intended purpose is. So federalism is neither good nor bad. It's, it's a mere tool. It's how it is then used to settle uh, conflict because it provides the ability uh, to actually uh, Take, uh, take a divided society on the path of reconciliation. I think the second, the second thing that has to be drawn out, as uh, Minister McConnell mentioned in the case of Ethiopia, is at the end of the day, the kind of system you create has to be rooted in your own reality. Uh, each, the, no two federations are alike. Uh, every federation is different, as it should be, because it, is, it should be a response to the particular social, economic, political context of the country in which it is established. The, the, I think the third thing, again, that emerges from this is the whole, uh, the whole issue of whether federalism uh, enables unity or enables secession, secession. And again, on that, I would say that it is meant as a tool to preserve the unity and integrity of a country. But on the same, at the same time, 
badly designed, uh, poorly thought out processes and institutions can aid and abet uh, the idea of, of separatism or, or uh, separation. And, and to be fair, uh, through history, if one were to look at the pathology of fe federations, there are a number of federations around the world which have failed. And so as, as we think about how we design federations or, or how we use federalism as a tool uh, to, to, uh, to um, bridge uh, deeply divided societies, I think it's important both to draw on the positive lessons that one sees from existing federations, as well as to learn from the, uh, the negative experiences that led to state breakdown and disintegration in federations that have failed. Because I think these, uh, it's only that composite uh, uh, knowledge that's then going to help one uh, adequately use uh, federalism as a tool for, uh, for, for building, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of peace building and establishing a unified state. Having said that, uh, I think also it's fair to recognize that federalism is probably not the tool you want to use in every society. I mean, looking at the three cases we have here, Ethiopia, Cyprus, Myanmar, what is particular about these countries, of course, is that they, all of these countries have territorially defined uh, minorities or territorially defined ethno-linguistic groups. So where, where you have society, divided societies that are not ethno-linguistically territorially defined, uh, there may be a challenge and maybe, you know, a centralized state with some kind of uh, consociational arrangement is, is a better way uh, to move uh, forward in, in that case. And I think uh, the last comment I would like to make is in the context of what is going on in Ethiopia. Ethiopia has now been a federal state for 27 years, as the Minister McConnell pointed out, uh, but they too are at, at a historic uh, crossroads uh, in the politics uh, uh, of the country. And this goes to the issue of saying that just because one, one has established a federal system, it's not the end of history. Federalism is dynamic because it, it is a response to the uh, social, economic, political demands of a population. And these evolve and change over time. And so when one crafts a federal system, uh, one has to craft institutions and processes that, that are flexible and can respond uh, to to the needs of the population as as things change. I mean, who would have thought, uh, you know, a year ago that we would be in this pandemic situation, you know, which which uh, which has tried, uh, you know, it, it's hard enough for countries that are so, so, socioeconomically challenged uh, uh, developmentally, but even even in 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 first world federations. I mean, I'm I'm speaking to you here from Canada now, where Canada has had uh, historically. Uh, some of the most uh, uh, fiscally uh, decentralized uh, subnational entities who have been very, very autonomous because they've been able to raise their own source revenue. Well, now with all the lockdowns uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic, uh, provincial revenues have collapsed completely. And so this is going to impart a new, uh, a new dynamic into the relationship between the provincial governments and the federal government, because uh, in this pandemic situation, the only the only level of government that has the ability to spend money is going to be the national government, the federal government. And and so, uh, I mean, all this to say that federalism is dynamic, and it's important that policymakers and stakeholders recognize that it's dynamic, and that it's important from time to time to revisit the arrangements that you may have come to. And so peace building is not just about the end of war, uh, but it is also about maintaining social stability uh, and, and providing the kinds of services that your population expect uh, from, from, from a state. So with this, uh, with this I will end uh, today's panel discussion. Uh, again, I want to thank you all very much, Minister McConnell, uh, Deria Beatli, Ted Midlwin, uh, for taking the time to be with us today. I know you all have very busy schedules. Uh, and I really appreciate that you've taken the time to, to, to be with us and to have this discussion.